Thank you. And also welcome to the people who are who might be online. I, I actually don't know. Um, so what's this talk about? Um, my idea is that at the end of the talk, you have an idea about um, how mindfulness and agile are actually connected. Uh, reason is I work as an agile coach and um, I also teach mindfulness. And at, at some places, not every time, I combine these two things in certain ways. Um, so that's the idea that you understand why, why is that actually, I personally think, a really, really useful combination and really something interesting to look into. Um, I'm also going to talk about why I think that mindfulness actually will be as successful as Agile in maybe 20 years or something. So I think this will even grow. You will hear more about that. And mostly what I want for this talk is actually to make you a little bit curious. So um, that, you know, you get some ideas about mindfulness. And if you really say at the end, yeah, I'm going to look into it a little bit more, then you also get some pointers on how to do that. So I just want to make you quite curious. So again, how we're doing this, going to talk briefly about what is actually mindfulness? What does this word really mean in the context that I'm using it? I'm going to talk about a bit the success of Agile, um, why I think that it is actually a success. And then I'm going to give you three reasons why I think that mindfulness will also be uh, in a similar way successful. And then we kind of close with, okay, what to do with all of this now? So what's mindfulness? Um, I actually want to ask you first. Uh, maybe you can throw in some words, some associations, some images you have when you hear the word mindfulness. What comes up? You know, is it orange robes, sitting in positions where your knees hurt? So what, what comes up for you? Just throw something in. Now being present. Consciousness. What else? Self-awareness. Okay, yeah. So these are like typical aspects of, of mindfulness. Um, and the things I said before, like with the orange robes and the knees that hurt and the incense, you know, that's burning in the background and stuff like that. Um, that's actually not so much what I mean by, um, by mindfulness. When I'm talking about mindfulness, I, I'm usually meaning something like a modern mindfulness approach. And while these mindfulness techniques, many of them are hundreds or e some of them even thousand years old, um, something that's really interesting is that in the last 30 years, something like a modern mindfulness approach or practice has, has kind of emerged. And I'm going to give you just some pointers of what I mean by that. Well, first, it's about a way to develop mental skills. Um, and this way is a way of training. Um, so, so it's not just about saying something like, um, yeah, we should be more mindful with our colleagues or, you know, I should be more kinder to my colleagues. Of course, it's cool if you have this intention, but then the question is, why aren't you already doing that? So mindfulness practice really gives you a way, a training to get to this kind of yeah, intention, yeah, to live that. Yeah. And that training is systematic. Yeah. Just to give you an example, uh, let's assume I go to the gym for the first time. Um, then, you know, a trainer comes and, and looks at me and we do some exercises together. And then he or she will give me a training plan. Yeah. And this training plan will follow a certain structure. There is a system behind how this training plan is designed. Yeah, you do these three exercises and then you have a break for two days and blah, 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 blah. Stuff like that. Yeah? So it's not just made up by the person who's giving me the training plan. Uh, there's actually a system behind that, how you design those things. Right? And that also has emerged in mindfulness practice in recent years. That the knowledge that was there about how to train people gets more codified, it gets more systematic, and people are actually putting these systems out. So it gets much more repeatable, much more measurable, right? So third thing is, um, while these things, of course, come from uh, several religious contexts, I mean, most of the stuff that we, when we talk about mindfulness comes from a Buddhist context, but actually all like big world religions have some kind of contemplative practice. 
Um, and this is kind of removed from the technique itself. So as someone who practices that, I don't need to kind of start to get into a certain belief system to understand this. Um, I can do it without it, without the belief system. And these, all these things are really important for the last part because w what we actually want to do is we, wanna, uh, we want that this is based on science. Yeah? And mindfulness right now, or in, in the last years, have, has become a totally valid research subject. So mindfulness is nothing esoteric anymore. It's like there are many, many researchers out there publishing hundreds of papers each year about the topic of mindfulness and how it works and what it does in the brain and how it changes the body and stuff like that. Um, so it has become a totally valid research subject. Um, I'm not going to talk about the results of that in this talk. I've done other talks uh, with, that, uh, with that topic, but just so you know, it's like, it's research, there are some promising results, some are disappointing, you know, so, but we are learning a lot about how mindfulness actually works and what exactly works there. So that's what I mean by kind of modern mindfulness approach. Um, and what are the skills that mindfulness trains? Um, so there are three of them in the model that I use. There are actually several models, but in the model that I use, there are three of them. That's concentration, clarity and equanimity. So let's look at concentration for a second. Um, concentration is the capacity to stay focused on what is important for you, on what you want to focus on. And that definition sounds trivial, but actually doing this in practice, in real life, you probably know that it's actually, or it can be quite hard to do that. Yeah? So, and there's actually really interesting research around that. Um, so there's research around how often a, a person working in IT, for example, a software developer, is interrupted. Yeah, so you do some kind of task and then something happens, you know, you get a phone call, if someone steps on, like, you know, comes to your desk, asks you something that's not related to the kind of stuff you're working on. And there's research on how often that happens. And again, just a quick question, just throw in a number in minutes, what do you guess, what is, what is the number? let's say before Corona times, like in an, in an office environment. Wh what's the number? It's like one minute, five minutes, 50 minutes. What do you, seven, 20. Okay. Say it again. Or, yeah, yeah, I think I heard. Uh, one hour, okay, yeah, okay. So in the study, there are several one, but in the study I'm referring to, it actually was 11 and a half minutes. So that was the average time someone could work uninterrupted on one task. Yeah. That's a rather frustrating number because uh, software development is something that is really, uh, where you can really easily get into a state of flow. And you probably know these days where you get into a state of flow. You open your computer, you start to program or do your stuff or design a whatever, uh, a design a UI or write a concept or whatever you do. And you have one of these magically lucky days where actually nobody disturbs you. And then two hours later, you look up from the screen and you think, wow, that was really cool. Now that was like one of the most productive two hours I had in a long time. And it was so much fun. It's, it's in a way deeply satisfying to be in such a flow state. Um, unfortunately, we, only, we also know from research that to get into a flow state, it takes a bit more than 20 minutes. So if you have like interruptions ele every 11 minutes, uh, you actually have, you never get into, the, into these flow states. Um, and that's one of those days then where at the end of the day, you kind of think, what the hell did I do the whole day? Right? It's like, you know, then we have all this and that, and then I worked on this, and it's like, ugh, it's exhausting, right? Because we never get into this flow state. Um, so 11 and a half minutes. But the other really interesting thing about that, um, about that study was that they also looked at, or that they actually found out that 50% of those interruptions weren't caused by my surrounding, they were caused by the person themselves. 
So that's a situation where you do something and you probably, at some point, you find yourself pressing Alt-Tab and then reading the news or checking Facebook or writing an email that's maybe work-related but has nothing to do with what you were just doing. So half of these interruptions are actually interruptions that the person themselves causes without like an obvious necessity. Yeah. So, and this is actually a, a thing where agile and mindfulness already connect. With agile, we try to change our environment so that we have less interruptions. Yeah. So we, we ruthlessly prioritize. We say, yeah, we are, we are you know, not going to start 10 things at one time. We are going to start like one or two or three, and that's all, and not more. Everything else will be pushed away. So I can focus on, on this one thing. So Agile tries to create patterns and structures around us that helps us concentrate. And with mindfulness, you can actually train concentration. Yeah. And, and that's like one of the things I really want you to remember when you, when you look at that slide. These things are trainable. So your level of concentration is something that you can slowly increase yeah and of course there will be you know many ups and downs but you know the base level of concentration with a, with some training yeah you can slowly increase that and that is huge just imagine if you could be like whatever 10 percent more concentrated so you can stay in um in, in in flow states more easily uh, for a bit longer or you can easily more easily enter those flow states because you have less interruptions um, that contributes to so much well one maybe probably efficiency and output but also to so much more satisfaction okay so i'm going to talk about the other two later uh, about the other two ones okay so let's look Let's make a little shift. You know what mindfulness is. Let's look at the success of Agile. And I'm saying Agile is a huge success story. Yeah. So, and I don't know about you. Some of you, at least internally, might say, well, I don't know. Not in my company or not in the company I used to be or not in the company my friend works for, right? So, yes. Um, uh, I mean, I work as an agile coach. Not everything we do is successful. There's a lot of bullshit out there. Many of these things go wrong, and agile is definitely not easy. Yeah? So there's a lot of kind of frustration around that. But what I actually mean by it's a success story is that I would say there there isn't a company out there in the world that, or I, I hope so, that is not at least kind of looking into that. So what I sometimes say to my customers, like, my guess is if, if you are the CEO of, you know, a medium sized or even a really large company, and you have never heard of Agile and you haven't like done any steps to at least explore that, I would say you're not doing your job. So, and that, that's what for now I would call a huge success. Because the goals of Agile aren't new. Yeah? What, 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 we, what do we want to achieve with Agile? We want to kind of deliver faster to the market. We want to be more customer-centric. We want to build the learning organization. You know, these things, they, they weren't new. They were there way before Agile. And there were actually already many people out there trying to create systems or principles or practices to actually change companies in that direction. And nothing stuck in the way that Agile did. So who did that? Um, so I don't know if you know. Um, so the kind of the little the birth moment for Agile is actually just 20 years ago, pretty exactly 20 years ago. Um, and that was with the manifesto for Agile software development. So, and the manifesto is really just a website uh, or a web page. And there are like 12 principles, four pairs of values. You know, if you don't know it, just look it up. Yeah. And so, how did that come to be? And that was that like 17 people met for three days somewhere in the US and they went skiing. Yeah. So, they were 
uh, they were in some kind of ski resort. So in the morning they went skiing and in the afternoon they did some workshops and created this Agile manifesto in three days. And of course they brought a lot of their knowledge and their experience, but, but th that was basically just the birth moment of Agile. Huh? So now, and then of course, like the 20 years we had since then and a lot of community and a lot of people pushing the ideas. Yeah, of course it wasn't just that, but that was kind of the birthing moment. So now imagine you are one of these people that, you know, 20, 25 years ago working in organizational development or like the big consulting companies trying to find ways, how do we change our clients organization? What can we do so that they become more flexible, more adaptable, uh, more resilient, you know, faster, you know, to being able to deliver products faster and so on and so on. So there were many people working on that. And these kind of 17 software development nerds that they met there, uh, they kind of did that. And that's what I think is, is like a huge success, right? Um, so let's look at why I think this actually was successful. So what I will do, I, gi I will give you like three reasons why I think that Agile was as, su as successful in the sense that I just said. And then also argue that, okay, and mindfulness will be successful in a similar way. So let's look at that. So first, actually, my argument, my first argument is that it's actually really important who met there. The people who framed all of this, um, it's really important. Um, and there's a reason that it was that it worked for those people who met in the skiing hut and not for some, you know, consultant in one of the big consulting companies. Yeah. So why is that? Um, if you look at the Agile Manifesto webpage, there is it's actually quite hidden. There's a li little link somewhere that goes to another page. And there they write in like six, seven, eight paragraphs about uh, the history, like how, how did this happen? So basically a little bit uh, and uh, quite a bit more of what I've just told you now. Yeah? So how did this Agile Manifesto came to be? And the interesting thing is in the first or second para paragraph, there's this phrase that, well, if you would have looked at our skiing hut, you would have seen that a bigger gathering of organizational anarchists would be hard to find. So that's literally the statement from the web page. Yeah? So, and that's how the authors of the Agile Manifesto saw themselves 20 years ago. That's what they said about themselves, that we are organizational anarchists. And I would translate that a little bit in kind of a way, I would phrase it a little bit different. I would say, this is a group of hackers, or this were a group of hackers. Because what's the hacker mindset? Um, it's like to use systems to, in a creative and unconventional way, in order to learn, in order to tinker, to break things apart and set it back together, hopefully with, with in a more useful way. Right? And I think that's, that's what they did. Yeah? Just as an example, um, three of the people who were there were Ken Beck, uh, Watt Cunningham and Ron Jeffries. So they, they are the inventors of uh, extreme programming. So and they had invented this in like 95 or something. I think that's when the book came out about extreme programming. Um, and they said things like, you know, 25 years back, you know, we are going to test our code continuously. So, and I, I mean, I, I, I wasn't in software development back then, but I met people uh, like when I started to work who were in software development in 95 and they said, to me, even years later, that's totally absurd. You know, testing is so expensive. It's so much manual labor. There's no way we're going to continuously test our software. We are happy if we can test it in the end. And then hopefully everything works out and we know that it doesn't. Yeah? Or they say things like, we write our requirements on little index cards and then we talk about it. And we call that user stories. And people at that time, like this was absurd. 
You know, someone would have said, you know, honestly, I just bought a hugely expensive Hume L2. I had like 15 analysts trained in it. And now you come and want to tell me that we write down requirements on little index cards and talk about it. What the, yeah. So that's, back then this was really, yeah, absurd. It was really revolutionary. So they actually used this hacker mindset in order to hack the process and the organization around software development. So how is that for mindfulness? Actually, the formative people for mindfulness in the West in the beginning were the hippies. <laughs> yeah, it's the people who like in the 60s kind of went on this, you know, hippie track that even had a name. I actually didn't know that it was really called the hippie track. So and they went to India and to what are the countries around that and you know, um, explored themselves and, you know, and some of them had actually really good teachers and some of them stayed longer and some of them brought back their knowledge and shared it. But that was actually quite mixed with all the other stuff about hippies, about, you know, the way to see life. So it's, it was kind of mangled together. And that's why I think it's really important what happened in the last 20, 30 years to kind of untangle that and to really uncover what is really mindfulness and what's kind of the other hippie stuff. I, I do like hippies. I, sometimes I think I would have loved to live at that time and kind of experience that myself, but it's, it was just very kind of, you know, how do you say that in English? Coagulated or something like that. Yeah. So that was back then. What is it now today? Today I would say it's like two things. One is big business. Big business is also there in agile and I think it's also important uh, in Agile, because that's what kind of brought in the visibility, like, you know, all the companies and all the, uh, the certification schemes that are out there and, and stuff like that. Yeah? Um, but that big business is also already present in mindfulness. Um, like, I would say that almost if, if there's a redesign of a leadership program within companies, you know, now they almost always include a mindfulness component in it. So it becomes very normal to have this kind of aspect in your leadership training. Yeah. Uh, that's because like many big companies have already done that. Google has that, SAP in Germany has that, LinkedIn has done all of that. Um, so there are many good examples out there. Um, Another example is Calm. Calm is a meditation app, one of the three big meditation apps. They had a financing round last December and they were evaluated with, uh, I think, $2.2 billion. So, and, and think about it, this is a meditation app. Um, so the basic function of a meditation app is, like if I'm really very much oversimplifying, is playing sound files. Right? Because, you know, you play like guided meditations. And of course, you know, it's very smart how you guide people through it. So it's really way oversimplified. But, but that's kind of the technological basis of all that. Yeah? And it's 2.2 billion. Yeah. So, but also in mindfulness, there is, uh, there are actually these kind of hackers out there. Um, the person you see here uh, is Shinzen Yang. Uh, he's one of my teachers, so the one, the guy down there with the with the stuff on his head, where they, um, you know, measure some brain waves while he's meditating. And he's really a science nerd, so he's like a lot into science. He's also a like 40 years meditation teacher with a strong, and he has lived like you know a couple of years in Japan, a couple of years in. In India, um, he speaks uh, kind of a lot of Asian language, so he can translate the original text. And he's like one of the people working really hard to kind of transfer that old, sometimes ancient knowledge into a modern version that is scientifically researchable. Um, and there are quite a few others out there. They aren't as visible as in the Asia movement, but they are out there. He has written a book with a very modest title, The Science of Enlightenment. Um, and there are other books out there that are called The Mindful Geek. So stuff like that. So these things are also happening. Yeah? In, in a very, I would say, in a very similar way to what the uh, 17 people at the Agile movement did. So it's the people 
And also I would argue that if you don't fall into the, ma the marketing trap of mindfulness, so some of the marketing traps are, or, or you know, what I would like you to remember, that it's mindfulness, it's not just about relaxation. Yeah? Of course, it's a part of it. Um, it's not about like floating in space, like, like we saw in this Time magazine, you know, you look pretty and you do this and then you, uh, you kind of almost lift from the ground and then you, whatever. Um, it's not just about like in the leadership trainings, yeah, I'm going to perform better and, you know, be a better leader and then my career advances and stuff like that. Of course, it kind of influences that, but, but it, that's not really what it's about. It's much more about actually getting to know yourself, uh, understanding yourself. You know? And because what, what do you do with mindfulness? You explore consciousness, whoever just said that, you explore your attention, and that influences every moment you have, every experience you have. So my experience of standing here and speaking to you is kind of mediated, is, is influenced by the way I perceive myself and by the way how I direct my attention. In your way of sitting there and listening, it's the same thing. So in every second, we have that influence. And mindfulness helps you to explore that, helps you to explore how this works. So if I do a little, uh, if I transfer that in, in, or say that in a different way, it's actually what you do is with mindfulness, it's exploring your own operating system, getting to know what works well, what doesn't work so well, what's fast, what's slow, stuff like that. Yeah? So I would say that mindfulness is actually a practice um, that people like, I, I'm saying us now, you know, people like software developers, people like, or people like who like to tinker with things, who like to understand systems, and like I said, take them apart and set them together or find, you know, good tools of what else to do. Um, they are drawn to this kind of thing. And actually this kind of hacker community, I would say that it's full of nerds. There are a lot of IT people in there. Yeah? Um, so that's my kind of first argument. It's, you know, the, the, the type of people who are doing this are, you know, very similar. And I think that because of that, there it also will be successful. Okay, second reason. Um, I would say that both agile and mindfulness fulfill needs that are very present in our society right now, in the, in, in the world we live in. So just a couple of hundred years ago, people were working, probably had to work like six days a week, very hard to just make sure to have enough food and maybe some shelter. And honestly, probably for most of us, this is done by Tuesday afternoon. Uh, so then we have kind of checkmarked that and the rest of the week is then for something else. Yeah. So our needs regarding our workplaces have changed. You know, there are things like, I want to be respected. I want to work on, I want to work on eye to eye level with my peers and even with people who are higher in the hierarchy than me. Yeah. I don't want a boss who tells me what to do. Except that boss really knows my kind of work, then I'm happy to learn, but not because he would, she is just my boss. Uh, I'm not buying into that. Uh. So we want less cognitive dissonance. So cognitive dissonance is the, the difference between what is said and what I experience. So if a company says, um, our employees are of the utmost importance to us, yeah, or a most important asset, yeah, and then you speak to one of the employees of that company and you say, well, how is that? Yeah, how is it going? And he goes like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that's uh, cognitive dissonance. Yeah? So if you know, something is said and your inner experience in the company is like totally different. Same with agile, no? someone says it's agile, but then you know, people run like three times a day, the CEO comes into the room and says, yeah, I have a great new idea, now we do this. You know, drop everything and now we do this. Yeah, that's also not really agile. No? 
So I would say cognitive dissonance is a nice scientific term for bullshit. So we don't want that bullshit anymore. And we are actually, most of us, in a position where, where we can say that without risking you know, some basic needs like not having enough food. So, and I would say that agile is a way to organize that meets those needs. Uh, and, you know, needs that are connected to, to what I've just said. Uh. So actually 10 years ago, I, uh, I co-developed with my colleagues back then, I developed a training that was called Scrum Master Skills. So that training was not about learning uh, Scrum. No, we, we assumed that you have done some certified Scrum Master class or something. Um, it was actually about actually really learning the skills to be a good Scrum Master, which you usually don't learn in a certified Scrum Master training, which is rather strange, but that's how it is. So you learned you know, how to facilitate a retrospective, you learn how to you know, improve decision making in teams, you learn how to influence the organization. So we talked about a lot of models and ways and practiced to do that. Yeah. And I, I loved that training and I, it was still like one of my, I, I, yeah, I really enjoyed it, it was great. I had so much fun like in these days. Um, and and they were always like, usually we had about like 10 participants and they were always about like two of them who at the end of the three days, they had really shiny eyes and they said something, I get it, I get it. This is how I want to work with my team right now. And what they meant by I get it is, I get it that it's about these kinds of needs, that agile is a promise that agile that you, we can sense that agile has the potential to get us closer to these needs and i think that's why agile is successful of course quite often it doesn't deliver there's disappointment because you know you know sometimes it doesn't work with agile yeah but if you look at you know how it's framed how it's taught and what the content of agile is i would say it you, you can sense this potential of working together in a different way that's more life affirming more satisfying and so on and that's why i think that this is now actually working and that, you know so many people are talking about that so mindfulness is um very similar yeah it's a practice a personal practice so i can better meet my own needs for these things right so I said mindfulness is something around getting to know myself better. Um, so if it's not, you know, and, and well, like I need to say, um, um, one of the things we also learned uh, is that um, it's not about having more money, yeah, that makes us happier. So of course, like if you like work six days a week to just basically give you enough food and, and some shelter, then more money helps you. But if that is covered, you know, by Tuesday afternoon, um, um, more money usually doesn't mean more happiness. And that's true, I would say, for most of us. Yeah? It's very, a very well-researched fact that, you know, if you, if you are at a certain level of income and then you make more, it doesn't increase your happiness. There are even cases, certain conditions where it actually decreases your happiness. So, so it's also not about making more money. Um, so, and then the question comes up, what is it really about? And like I said, you know, mindfulness helps you to understand yourself. You know, so to really explore, what's the kind of way I want to live? What is the nourishing way for me? A, a, a way that I find meaningful. And we can less and less get the answers from the outside. There are many answers out there, but there's also the sense of, I don't want to just you know, take over this answer without reflecting it. And mindfulness is really something that helps you for that. Yeah. So there are a lot of kind of needs out there that are um, kind of met or dealt with by agile and also by mindfulness. Yeah? They, sometimes they are the same, sometimes it's like a bit of similar ones, stuff like that. So both of them um, meet some needs. 
that are very present in this moment in time. So third reason, I say that they actually both, mindfulness and agile, deliver an answer to the same problem. And that problem is how to deal with complexity. Um, we do live in a complex world. Mm, in it's complex and we notice it's complexity that the problems are complex because we can't just make a perfect plan. We can't predict how things will unfold and then just, you know, make this plan and then just go forward. forward yeah? So customers can't tell us the exact requirements. And that's not because they are stupid. It's not because they are unwilling. It's not because we haven't trained them enough. It's because it's a complex problem. And in a complex problem space, you can't, you know, write down all the requirements in the beginning and then just do that and in the end have a satisfying product. Yeah. In the same way that we can't design our software like, you know, we just sit down for a month and then we have it and then we just implement it. Yeah. So waterfall doesn't work in a complex world. And Agile is exactly the answer to that. Agile is a set of practices and, you know, principles and some tools and uh, all kinds of stuff, yeah, that deals with this challenge, this complex challenge. Yeah. That's why we do iterations. That why, that's why we want to do increments that are tested and releasable and we can look at them. Um, that's why we try hard to get really fast feedback. Uh, it's it's why we you know have build pipelines and we we do a lot of work to you know reduce the time that this build pipeline runs so we can get faster feedback so it even like goes down to the very technical level yeah and agile is a way of or kind of acts on the area of teams you know how do we organize as teams and how do we organize this as organizations and then we have lots of technical stuff that helps us doing that and mindfulness complements this on the individual level. Um, and I'm going to give you an example about that. I was coaching a team two and a half years ago. And we kind of, yeah, we're doing Scrum and, you know, things were going along pretty much fine. And at some point, uh, the, the product owner of that team, you know, uh, we, we, we just met. Um, uh, we, were we just met in the, in the hallway and he told me, oh, Marcus, I'm, I just had a really shitty moment. I um, just have had a, um, a, a conversation with my boss. And my boss basically summarized, uh, he told me that, uh, you know, come on, let's finalize this damn product backlog, have it estimated, make a plan, and then tell me when you will deliver all that stuff. And you know, how much it will cost. You know, you know, just, you know, get it together, you know, and do it. And then we are, you know, I know we're done with that. Uh, I know how things will unfold. You know? So, and then it took a little bit of conversation to kind of, okay, what was going on, blah, 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 blah. And we kind of figured things out. And But later on, I, I kind of reflected on why, what did happen? Why did that boss, why did he say these things to the product owner? And, and I realized, well, that's, that was my guess at least, um, that it had to do with uncertainty. So I, I was pretty sure it didn't have to do with this, what is often said that, you know, that person is old fashioned or too stupid to get agile. That, I'm, that person was like really smart um, and really experienced. And he had also like, he had been in agile trainings and I'm pretty sure he got kind of the essence of it, of what it, what it is about. Uh, so it wasn't all of that. So in my sense was it, it was just a moment where you, where he felt a lot of uncertainty. And uncertainty in agile is quite special because we, we actually don't, we actually allow uncertainty to be there. And we trust that we have a process that helps us deal with it. 
right? So we do sprints and you know iterations and blah blah blah, blah. and that process helps us to deal with the uncertainty. But the uncertainty is there. Yeah, we, we we kind of we don't say yeah now we know everything. This is where we will be in three years. Yeah, so it's uncertain where we will be in three years. And th that's not just something intellectual. That's also something emotional, because like for most of us, at least for me, definitely for me, uncertainty feels unpleasant. It's really something that you can sense in your body. So, ah, nah, mm, nah. So, and if we have something that's unpleasant, natural tendency is to make it go away, right? Yeah. So, how do we do that? Well, agile is a way to make it go away in a certain way, but if we are kind of acting not very consciously, not being very aware about what we are doing and that I'm just trying right now to get this unpleasant feeling away, then what happens most often is that we act out of um, um, some automatism that I had learned from my environment. And that person, the boss, was a very experienced project manager. So he had learned and had worked very successfully as a classical trained program, a project manager for many, many years. And what is, is he doing if he feels like it's uncertain, we need to do something? We make a plan, right? Or we tell someone else to make a plan. And of course, we know that this plan is probably fake and won't work, yeah? But on an emotional level, there's still a relief. Yeah. Okay, now we have a plan. Whew. Yes. Good. Wow. Yeah. So it helps for that, actually. Yeah. So what we need is actually the skill to allow uncertainty, or in general, to allow to allow experience to be in our system, without falling into a trap of immediately reacting to it uh, out of whatever unconscious trained you know behaviors uh, that might have been useful sometime but we actually don't want to do that right now but it happens automatically and we all know that we all do lots of stuff where you think yeah i did that and afterwards i wasn't so happy about it but it was kind of it just happened right we all know that yeah uh? And what I just said, the, to have the a skill to, um, to, to let an experience be without necessarily reacting right away, that's actually the definition of equanimity. So if you think back to the beginning of the talk where I said concentration, clarity, equanimity, that's equanimity. And that's trainable and mindfulness trains that. So my experience is where you have, when you have like an organization where there's kind of a higher level of equanimity where people can be more present with what is happening, but without having the immediate need to do something about it. Uh, that's organizations where you can actually experiment a lot more uh, because they are open to trying new things. Uh, you can try out new things. And that's kind of exactly where, what we need for Agile. Right? So I would say that mindfulness is actually a really great individual what well, mindfulness trains kind of the individual skills that we need for agile to succeed okay reason number three so what we do now is i would like you to get to talk with your neighbor uh, like for really just one minute about what you took so far from this talk. If you don't have a neighbor or if you're listening from online, you can also use Menti with this code. Uh, just go to menticode.com, enter the number back there, uh, up there, and then um, just leave, you know, what did you take so far from it? And here you don't need to use Menti, you just talk with your neighbor. It's more important for me that you have connection and that we have this on the screen. Okay? Okay, one minute. Go. Okay. Okay, close down. I realize I'm actually not sure if my Wi-Fi is still working. Oh, no, it is. Okay.
Uh, well, yeah, mindfulness had become part of sea level training. Okay, great. Yeah, we're gonna look into that at the end again. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for that. Um, we're gonna see at the end if there's more. Um, so, just a final point. Um, so, what now? If I have sparked your interest in mindfulness, what can you do? Well, the first thing actually, which is quite useful, I would say, is to use apps, right? And I've kind of written some of the maybe a bit more unknown apps down there. Inside Meditation Tema is like a nice, very old app, um, tons of content, not very well structured, uh, uh, but I like it. Uh, Medito is uh, run by a, um, uh, what's, what's the word, a foundation, so it's not a company behind it. Uh, they are they they do their app based on donations. So um, unlike the others, all these three apps don't sell your uh, information, which often the very big ones do, and they anal do a lot, of, a lot of analyzing and and kind of stuff like that that I don't really want to support so much. So Medito is kind of run by a um, uh, yeah I don't know the English word now the foundation and Brightmind is actually. Um, quite expensive but content wise and structure wise it's it's really really well done uh, they just uh, pushed out a new version of the app and i'm uh, really excited how they did that um, other thing is uh, find good training i would highly recommend that at some point i waited me personally i waited when i got into mindfulness uh, more intensely seven years ago so uh, mindfulness was with me already since since I was 15, I started to do that. But seven years ago, um, I really got into it deeply. And I waited way too long to get good training. Um, I tried to do it all on my own. Um, so, yeah. Um, good, what is good training? Uh, like if you're German speaking, I offer training. But in general, if you what's good training, it's hard to find. It's hard to define. But the one thing I would look for is that in the beginning, it should help you develop meditation or mindfulness as a habit. Because like I said, mindfulness is training. So it's, it's like going to the gym. If you just sign up once and show up once, it doesn't really help you a lot. Yeah? So it, it's basically, it needs to become something that has to be part of your regular life. Yeah? You know, meditating daily, two times a week, one time a week, whatever, but, but it has to become a habit. So I would kind of look for that if, that, if that's a training that does that. Okay.